This is the new Vauxhall Grandland. Well, it's an updated version of the old Grandland X, but they've now dropped the X, given it a new face, seriously up the level of tech inside the cabin, and you can even get it with night vision. Now it's gonna need to be good because it's going up against some seriously big players. Think the Nissan Qashqai and Kia Sportage to name but a few. Now, are the updates enough to elevate it above the rest? Well, today I'm gonna try and find out. But before I go any further, if you like what we do, why not hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more awesome videos, just like this one. This may be a facelift, but there's actually quite a few significant changes going on here, particularly when it comes to the design. So at the front, we've got Vauxhall's new visor grille, or well, opals if you are living in mainland Europe. And it comprises of this black strip that runs along the front of the car with a very small vent below it to cool the engine. And either side of it, we've got these very neatly integrated lights. That being said, you can tell that the car wasn't actually designed around this face and that they've kind of just stuck it on the front because the old car had these very curvy and large lights that came all the way up to here. But because the visor is quite flat, they've had to put this little filler bit in at the side. Nothing particularly wrong with it, it just maybe looks a little bit jarring compared to Vauxhall's built around the brand new visor grille. Now we do also have a completely different front end as well when it comes to the bumper. Down here, we've got fake vents. These aren't real, but they do add a little bit of aggression to the Grand Land. And also this nice big large vent down the bottom here, just to provide a bit more extra cooling, particularly with the visor blocking off a lot of the front end. But this is the ultimate edition car. It's the top spec version. So some design elements are gonna be a little bit different compared to the rest of the car, such as the cladding at the side. It's body color on here, but on the rest of the range, it's either plastic or in glass gloss black. And one last element while we're at the front of the car are these headlights. They actually come with 84 pixels on either side, which Vauxhall claims is the most pixels on any car in the segment. What a brag. The side profile of the car is pretty much exactly the same as the old car because this is a facelift and not a brand new model generation, but you do get a new set of wheels. On the Ultimate, you get these 19 inch wheels and I think they look fantastic. And at the back, the design changes aren't as big as they are at the front, but you do now have the Grandland name kind of in big, bold lettering below the Vauxhall badge. So everyone knows that you're driving a Grandland, but not a Grandland X, just Grandland. Now, although we've got the Ultimate here, this actual model doesn't have the power assisted tailgate, but if you go into a showroom and buy an Ultimate, you'll get that included. Now, Boot space really depends on which model you go for. The hybrid actually stores most of its electrical components in the back of the car and under the rear seats, and that cuts into boot space quite a bit. There's 390 litres in the hybrid, which is 124 litres shy of the regular petrol version. Now, it's not a problem that's unique to Vauxhall. A lot of plug-in hybrids have smaller boots compared to their petrol and diesel counterparts, but it's quite a big difference on the Vauxhall Grandland. But if you go for the petrol car or diesel car like we have here, 514 litres is actually pretty big. It's a fair bit bigger than the Nissan Qashqai and also the Ford Cougar, but it's still beaten by the Kia Sportage. And you can see that for yourself by clicking the link in the top right hand corner. Not a 10 minute video about boot space, it's just a section. That'd be a bit weird otherwise. But back to the Grand Land, you do have a movable boot floor. So if you want to open up a little bit more space, you can do so. And something I really love on SUVs is you've got little grab handles here so you can lower the rear seats with ease. The engine lineup comprises of two regular motors and a hybrid. Now, the non-electrified engines include a 1.2 litre petrol engine producing 130 horsepower, and you can have that as either a six-speed manual or eight-speed automatic. Zero to 60 comes about in 10.4 seconds if you go for the manual, whereas the auto is a little bit quicker at 10.3 seconds. Now, the other piston-powered motor is a 1.5 litre diesel engine, which also produces 130 horsepower. It's only available with the eight-speed automatic box, and it's the slowest of the bunch, taking 12.4 seconds to hit 60. It is, however, the one you're going to want to go for if you spend most of your time on the motorway. 
the one you're going to want to go for if you're looking to get this as a company car is the PHEV. Now it's based around a 1.6 litre petrol engine that's connected up to an electric motor for a total output of 225 horsepower. Now the good thing as well is that you can charge it up and run it on EV power alone for up to 39 miles. Now it's the fastest of the lot taking 8.9 seconds to hit 60 which doesn't sound that quick but bear in mind that most plug-in hybrids are faster at going from zero to 30. Now I don't have a figure for that I'm afraid but because you've got that electric power it just gives you a bit more shove lower down so it should feel nippier than the numbers suggest. But if you want a proper performance version, then there'll be a 300 horsepower plug-in hybrid version coming later in the year. There's a real mix of old and new in the updated Grandland. For example, this centre console and most of the dashboard design is exactly the same as what we had on the Grandland X. The steering wheel has also been lifted over too. And while it's nice to hold and the button quality feels not too bad, Vauxhall has released a new wheel design that we saw on the Vauxhall Astra. You can have a look at that by checking out my walk around of the Vauxhall Astra. And it just seems a lot nicer and more futuristic compared to this slightly ugly older design. The seats, however, have been updated and they do feel super comfortable. In fact, Vauxhall claims that they've been approved by German back experts, which means that your posture won't be destroyed on long journeys. But overall, it's not bad. It just feels a little bit cheap in comparison to the likes of the Nissan Qashqai, which costs around about the same, but feels a lot more premium on the inside. Now on the left hand side we've got a 10 inch screen which is available on the ultimate version and that's running Vauxhall's latest infotainment system. It's very basic, relatively sharp, can connect to both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But what I find really weird is that a lot of the screen real estate is taken up by the climate settings either side. But you have a dedicated climate control system down here in the center console. So why are you taking up so much screen space when I can just adjust it all manually in the first place? On the plus side, we've got a customizable digital cockpit. And if you go for the plug-in hybrid, you'll also get some hybrid graphics on there too. Plus, as an optional extra, you can get night vision, which looks 100 meters into the distance and gives you a little readout in the center of the display. And it comes up automatically as well when it senses that there might be animals or people nearby. The only thing though, is that it costs over a thousand pounds as an optional extra and on a Vauxhall that's quite a lot of money. And while we're talking about numbers we might as well get on to pricing. Now the new Grandland actually costs a little bit less than the outgoing Grandland X. The petrols kick off at £25,800 or £28,300 for the diesel or £32,800 for the plug-in hybrid. And with the plug-in hybrid Vauxhall claims that it's nearly 10% cheaper than the outgoing PHEV. Now, when you compare it with the competition, the Grandland stacks up pretty well, at least in terms of price. But I think a lot of it falls apart in the interior. The quality in here isn't nearly as good as most of its rivals. So although you might spend a little bit more money on something like a Kia Sportage or a Hyundai Tucson, or you find that the Nissan Qashqai's boot might not be quite as big, I do think they kind of represent slightly better value for money. Now this is a family SUV, so the rear seats are likely gonna get used, particularly on long holidays to Cornwall or wherever. Uh, and the good news is, is there's actually quite a lot of space. Knee room is pretty damn good, particularly with the driver's seat in my position. And headroom, if I set up straight, is pretty damn good as well. So if you're six foot and over, getting in the back of the Grandland shouldn't be a problem at all. It's also quite well equipped for a cheap car. For instance, we've got an armrest with two cup holders. Don't always get that in cars costing in the £20,000 region. And while there's only one USB port and it's an old style USB, you do actually get a three pin plug, which will come really handy if people wanna charge up laptops or iPads while in the back. Plus, it's actually gonna be quite comfortable if you sit in the middle because the floor is pretty much flat, which is really surprising. Now the Grand Land X wasn't exactly a bad car to drive, it was just, lacking some form of engagement. And the same can be said for the new Grandland. So we've got the 1.2 litre three cylinder petrol engine in this car with the six speed manual. And as I pointed out earlier, that's got the zero to 60 time of 10.4 seconds, but it actually feels 
quite a bit quicker than that. And I think the reason for that is this three cylinder turbo engine really likes it kind of low down in the rev range. So when you're kind of getting up to speed, it kind of gets there quite quickly. It's just when you really rev it out that it starts to lose puff a little bit. Refinement is also pretty good too. It's relatively smooth. You get a little bit of judder at lower speeds as you get with quite a lot of other three cylinder cars. They can feel a tad unrefined at times. And again, it doesn't always feel super happy if you're revving it out, but most of the way through the torque band, particularly low down, the Grandland does seem to be pretty much at home. And that's coupled up with this six-speed manual gearbox. Personally, I don't really feel like you're getting much going for the manual over the auto. This isn't really a performance car. But if you're the kind of person who still likes to have control over their gears, well, the option's there at least. The steering is very middle ground. There's some resistance to it, so it means that you get some element of where the weight of the car is. But again, it feels very standard for a crossover. These cars aren't really known for being all that distinct in the way they drive. What I will say though is I can tell there's a little bit of gearbox wind that probably won't pick up on my microphone. But it's when you're going around kind of town and you're maybe in one of the lower gears and you're revving it out a little bit, you can just hear this very, very slight whine. I wouldn't say that it has a massive impact on the way it drives, but it's pretty rare for cars to have a transmission whine in this day and age. And so it just sticks out a little bit like a sore thumb. And at most speeds as well, I think the ride quality is pretty good. I actually think it's better than a Kia Sportage, which really fell apart on very, very juddery roads. And the Grandland seems to be pretty well sorted. I'm only just getting this a slight bit of jiggle being sent through the car at higher speeds, but that might also be down to us having the 19 inch wheels, which you get on that top spec ultimate model. If you go further down the range for one of the entry level cars, you'll be on either 17s or 18s, and it might just ride a little bit better. Now what that does is it combines an adaptive cruise control, so the car will adjust its speed depending on the car in front of you, and it'll now keep you in the center of your lane. So it's not a lane assist of where it'll send an alarm into the cabin when you cross over the white lines. It'll actually keep you in the middle of the road. Now it's not like a full autonomous car and it won't slow down for things like roundabouts or corners, but it's still a really handy feature to have in what is a relatively affordable family SUV. But now the big question is, is the Grandland able to put up a fight with its many, many rivals in this family SUV corner of the market? And it's a bit of a mixed bag. The big upgrades, like the screens, really help out. It makes the car feel a lot fresher because without this digital dash, like you'd get in the old car, it felt like it had a seriously outdated interior, even when it first arrived. The new look also helps massively as well because it now makes this car feel a lot more desirable than its predecessor. And, you know, we do have some interesting tech on board. The only problem is, is that a lot of it comes at a premium. You know, we're talking about the night vision camera, which sounds really cool, but are you really going to want to spend over a thousand pounds optioning that on your Grandland? Probably not. And while the tech and cabin upgrades help it out, it's still not up to the par of something like a Qashqai or a Sportage. But bear in mind, it's a facelifted model. We can kind of see what Vauxhall's got up its sleeve with the new Astra, which genuinely looks like a step forward for the company. And this thing, it's not bad, but there are better options out there.